So we're entering the weird and wonderful world of beam me up communications when instead of radio waves we will be able to use visible light frequencies in order to transmit information. If the subject is of interest to you, please visit our website where you would find lots of related literature. But with this little treatise, I would like to enthuse you into looking at the aspects of visible light communications and its benefits in video transmissions. Naturally, the popularity of mobile phones led to the data tsunami that we are experiencing these days, and much of this is attributable to the predominance of video communications. So as you would see in the illustration over the past five years, uh, the video data transmitted has grown exponentially. So how do we transmit information with the aid of visible lights? Well, in its simplest incarnation, we could flicker the LED lights and use a low complexity photo detector in order to detect the bits. Of course, in reality, we are using much more sophisticated techniques, but we could view this array of LEDs as a large scale MIMO system, which is capable of transmitting 80 parallel streams. And this is taking place very power efficiently because LEDs operate at much lower power, yet providing similar illumination or potentially brighter light than the old incandescent bulb. So let's look at a simple indoor scenario. Our room model is constituted by a number of LED arrays on the ceiling and uh, we could fix the coordinate point zero somewhere in the middle of the room and we would consider a direct line of sight link as well as a single reflected path and the users can move around in a lab-like environment or in the home and receive video on the move. Now the history of video communications is really old. We could even argue that the old beacon system was relying on video communications where we could use smoke signals in order to signal information at a very low rate across the terrain. Uh, however, over the past 30 years, as digital signal processing has improved in great strides, we moved from H.261 to H.263, 264, and currently we are using the H.265 video codex. The secret behind the efficiency of these video codecs is that they rely on motion compensation, where there is an anchor frame, which is intra-frame coded, and the next couple of frames within a so-called group of pictures can be encoded with reference to this intracoded frame because the amount of movement in the consecutive frames is relatively limited and therefore only those parts of the picture have to be updated where there's substantial change. Now the price for this bitrate reduction is however that there is potentially delay as well as the error sensitivity is increased because if for example the reference frame is corrupted then all the consecutive frames have to be bought. So we looked at a relatively low complexity video streaming regime and let's now take a peek uh, at the room uh, where the LED lights uh, use, for example, the same frequencies uh, to cover the room. And therefore, at this black dot, as we move from point A to point B, the signal to interference plus noise ratio is zero decibels. What we expect, therefore, is, of course, a substantial video degradation in this region. Uh, although this is not really the case uh, for the more sophisticated so-called vectorized transmission regime that we conceived in this treatise, uh, but the radical unity frequency reuse-based system results into a large number of dropped frames and therefore 
a high peak signal to those ratio degradation. So as we view the peak SNR degradation versus the video frame index in a random walk scenario, we observe the same phenomenon, namely that the unity frequency reuse scheme drops a large number of frames, and so the peak SNR degradation is very often as high as 30 dBs. This is somewhat more mitigated with the, the, the higher frequency reuse based uh, scenario, but the best peak SNR is achieved by the vectorized transmission. Uh, only the frames around frame 5 to 10 or 9 are dropped in this situation. In terms of the subjective visual effects, the top row indicates the original flawless video and the numbers up here represent the frame index. The UFR scenario is badly corrupted and the higher frequency reuse scheme mitigates this degradation but the best video quality is doubtlessly achieved by the vector as transmission although again frame 8 is rather badly corrupted. So in this slide, we view the achieved video rate versus the frame index, and the circles represent the required video rate, uh, which is literally always achieved with the, the, the vectorized transmission, whereas by contrast, the UFR scheme uh, almost always fails to reach the required video rate, and therefore, it inflicts an excessive video frame uh, dropping probability. So the peak SNR distortion depends on the buffer size because we can afford uh, transmitting even those frames eventually where the required bitrate is momentarily higher than the instantaneously affordable rate if we can afford a little bit of buffering delay. And so if we buffer up to 16 frames, for example, then of course lip synchronization might be lost, but the peak SNR degradation remains relatively low. Now again, the trend is the same as previously, so we can see that the vectorized transmission associated with the triangles results into the lowest peak SNR degradation in the scenario considered, and the UFR gives you the highest peak SNR degradation. In a nutshell, the consumed energy is literally the same for all scenarios. We could argue that the achieved video bitrate is also similar for them, although the vectorized scheme gives you a marginally improved throughput. But the peak SNR degradation is almost negligible for the vectorized transmission whereas the other two scenarios suffer from an excessive frame dropping ratio and therefore a rather unacceptable peak SNR degradation. Naturally, I had to gloss over the technical depth of the paper, but I wish you intellectual stimulation reading the paper. Finally, let's complement the previous objective peak signal to noise ratio degradations also with the aid of some visual effects and we will be looking at two consecutive video clips. The first one is the UFR scenario associated with 15 frames per second video scanning and you will observe that there's a large degradation because the majority of the initial frames have been lost. By contrast, the VT2 vectorized scenario only has relatively limited video degradations at position 2 of the room and so it's vastly superior to the previous UFR scenario. Finally, let's complement the previous objective peak signal to noise ratio degradations also with the aid of some visual effects and we will be looking at two consecutive video clips. The first one is the UFR scenario associated with 15 frames per second video scanning and you will observe that there's a large degradation because the majority of the initial frames have been lost.
By contrast, the VT2 vectorized scenario only has relatively limited video degradations at position 2 of the room, and so it's vastly superior to the previous UFR scenario.